the gospel of John, the book of John has taken us. Let me do this. A thrilling. Actually, you know what? Let's do some epic music here. Let, let's just do a little epic intro for the last book of John. Let me see. I need my announcer voice. Here we go. Let's put some epic music on. How's this? Let's see. Is that epic? Hold on. Let's get some epic music. Here we go. The book of John has taken us through the life, teachings, and redemptive power of the Son of God. We've witnessed the breathtaking opening as the Word became flesh, divinity wrapped in humanity, miracles beyond our imagination, water transformed into wine, the blind given their sight, the sick made whole, and even the dead raised, but not just miracles, the words, His words have power, the teachings that cut through the political chaos, Jesus, the compassionate teacher who offers living water to thirsty souls. This is way too loud. Hold on. This epic music is distracting me. There we go. The way, the truth, and the life unleashing his shocking revelations as he asserts unity over and over again. What have we learned? That he and the Father are one. He's laid down his life for the sheep. His sheep hear his voice. Tonight we will witness the agony of his arrest, the spine-chilling trials before Pilate, the merciless crucifixion of the cross and an act of sacrificial love from laying his life down for the foundations of the world. But then we will see a mind-blowing climax. You guys like all these words here? An empty tomb, a risen savior. Death tonight will be defeated. Hope reignited and we'll encounter the risen Christ as he appears to his disciples, breathing his Holy Spirit into their weary souls and then commissioning them, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to go and preach the gospel. We will experience them encountering the risen Savior. Be prepared tonight for the transforming power of the Word of God as we finish off the close of the book of John, an epic tale of redemption, faith, and eternal life that leaves us forever changed. This is, ladies and gentlemen, the last of the series of the book of John. Let me turn the epic music off so we can get serious here. Get your Bibles out. Have fun. This is going to be a good time. This is the very end of our series. It feels sad. It feels sad that tonight we'll be ending the book of John, but we have a lot more to cover. So let's start it out here tonight. Maybe I should give you guys, let's see, let me turn this on. Maybe I should give you guys a little bit of a recap of what we went through last week. We know Judas led a group of priests and temple guards to arrest Jesus. Jesus voluntarily surrendered to the mob leaders, basically said, you guys can't take me. I'm, I'm giving myself up because this is all part of my plan and prophecy fulfilled. Peter tries to defend Jesus, ends up cutting off the servant's ear, which Jesus then healed. How amazing is that? While Annas was questioning Jesus in preparation for sentencing, Peter was in the court, courtyard denying Jesus in front of a little girl and other servants. Feels bad. Peter was denying Jesus just as was, as was prophesied when the rooster crowed three times. The religious leaders took Jesus to Pilate to pronounce the death sentence. Pilate can find nothing wrong with Jesus that he's guilty to be crucified. So Pilate says, listen, you guys can have Barabbas or you guys can have Jesus. This is an obvious choice. Choose Jesus. Barabbas is a thief. Barabbas is a criminal. Jesus has done nothing but heal the sick. But the people in fulfilling prophecy yell, give us Barabbas. They take a prisoner. They take someone that was in sin, someone that was a complete criminal over Jesus. And that is a prophetic picture of us. We are Barabbas. We're the ones that deserve to be on that cross. And Jesus took our place just as they said, give us Barabbas. Again, Pilate offered and they said, give us Barabbas. So let's go into chapter 19. And we're just going to walk through this, the book of John. This is a very brutal chapter because this will be the death of Jesus. This is where they're going to crucify our Lord and Savior. But we know the story doesn't end there. He's alive forevermore. Even as I preach, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. So the last verse of chapter 18 and I'll have the Bible on screen for those of you that are just laid back and don't have your Bible out. Then they all cried saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So here we have Pilate saying, listen, I can release a prisoner. It's custom that I should release someone over to you at the Passover. This was a customary thing. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And the people cry out saying, not this man, but Barabbas. There's a, there's a hatred. There's a demonic hatred for Jesus. And we're going to see that as we go through chapter 19 in our last night of the book of John, six months later. Let's do this. Verse 1, chapter 19. Type 1 if you could see everything on screen. And let me make sure my epic music's off. That would have been awkward if it was still on. Let me make sure we're good here. Okay, verse 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. 
And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are going to go into some other details about the crucifixion. John is a little bit more vague, so I will add in some commentary on Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But John's a little more vague when it comes to the crucifixion than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But it describes all that we need to know. They put a crown of thorns twisted on his head, and they put on a purple robe. Then they said, this is the, the wicked... Uh, soldiers that are scourging Jesus. Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. So, still not wanting to pronounce the death sentence on Jesus, Pilate ends up having him beaten, hoping that by beating Jesus, this would be enough for the Jewish people. And during this type of scourging, where it says he scourged them, the victim would be stripped naked, tied to a post, and the flogger would use a whip, which consisted of several uh, straps of leather, pieces of leather, they would call it the cat of nine tails, but it was a bunch of pieces of leather and they would put this in metal, they would put this in bone, and literally this was a U-shaped metal piece, butterfly looking thing that they would, it sounds very graphic and I'm not trying to be too graphic, but I need you to get what was happening. They would slash it around the person's waist and back and it would literally latch into the person and completely rip the flesh off them. This was not them just beating Jesus. This was literally a torture. This was a death sentence. In fact, many people would die during these lashes. So the Jewish law said you cannot give more than 39 lashes because they believe that after 39 lashes, any man would die. So they give Jesus 39 lashes. Roman law had no limit to this, but most people that were scourged in the manner that Jesus was scourged, they would not survive. This was absolutely horrific. After the flogging, the soldiers would ridicule Jesus and by putting a crown of thorns and these were sharp needle-like thorns into his head and then putting a purple robe around him, a valuable robe, about as valuable as gold was back in those days. This was a way of them mocking Jesus. This was a symbol. These were symbols of royalty, the crown and the purple robe. And now they wanted Jesus to look like a king, mock him. And then they would say sarcastically, like they would say, hail Caesar. They would say, basically hail king of the Jews and they would beat Jesus. But remember Isaiah 53 chapter 53 verse 5 says it was by his stripes we are healed. So it was these stripes that afforded us healing. Jesus could have went right to the cross as my friend evangelist TJ would say, but he takes a stop at the whipping post, takes those lashes because by his stripes we are healed. This was brutal torture and the brutal torture and I even thought about putting on a scene from the Passion of the Christ or a similar movie, but it's just too graphic. Actually, my video would get taken down if I showed you guys it, because it was extremely graphic. He would have been, commentators and historians say, unrecognizable after they scourged him. His flesh would be completely opened up. Likely, his insides and organs would be showing and being revealed. It would be a complete bloody scene of him on that whipping post. And I, I did was gonna put up some pictures of how they did it. Again, there's kids watching. It is a bit graphic the way that they scourged Jesus but they scourged Jesus and by those stripes we are healed, not realizing this was actually prophecy being fulfilled. Most people would have died, but we know that it wasn't Jesus's time to die. And I'm gonna show you in scripture that nobody took his life, he gave his life, and Jesus chose the moment that he died. Jesus chose the moment that he died. And all of the stuff I'm gonna to describe tonight, I want you to remember, he did this for you and me so that we can have access to God, so that we can enter into the Holy of Holies, have the Holy Spirit in us, and we can go from being at war with God to now having peace with God. So this was incredible, the work that Jesus did for us, to, for us to have the ability to even do this tonight, for us to be able to worship, for us to be able to praise, for us to be able to have peace with God, that we were at war with God. And one of my favorite things that the cross did, that the good news does, is the Bible says Jesus gives us peace now with God, that we now could be at peace in relationship with a God that we had no access to and no ability to reach. So brutal, brutal scene of him being scourged on that whipping post. And again, I'm adding some detail because Matthew, Mark, and Luke give more detail than John's gonna give. So I'm gonna tie in some parallels here. We're gonna go to verse four. Pilate then went out again. So as we can see, Pilate's torn. Pilate genuinely does not want to kill Jesus. He's very, very torn about this. So he goes out again, verse four, and said to them, behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. So for the third time, this is now the third time Pilate goes out to talk to the Jewish people. He brings out Jesus, who again would be unrecognizable from the beatings. And for the second time, 
Pilate declared Jesus' innocence. He goes, I have not found anything wrong with this man. And when Pilate says, behold the man, he wasn't politely introducing Jesus to the crowd. He was mocking them. He was mocking the Jewish leaders by basically saying this, look at this poor man. How can you believe he's a king? Have mercy and drop the charges. Like this poor guy that I'm literally beating to death almost, almost to the point of death. Psalm says he was unrecognizable. And he says, here's the man, I, here he is. You could have him, I have no fault in him. Verse six, again, this is a lot of it descriptive. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped verse four. Pilate then said, oh, I'm sorry, verse five. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and Pilate said to them, behold the man. I skipped that part, I apologize. Verse six, therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. So here's the chief religious people. Jesus has done nothing wrong. He's incredibly beat and scourged. And this is what the religious people yell. Instead of saying, he did nothing wrong, let him go. They're yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him for I find no fault in him. So he finally, Pilate's saying, listen, I found nothing with him. And then listen to what the Jews said in verse seven. The Jews answered him, we have a law and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Remember, up until this point, they weren't saying why they wanted him dead. They were saying, oh, he's revolting. Oh, he's causing this. Oh, he's doing. They were actually, the Bible says, looking for people to lie about Jesus. And now here they are saying the real reason why we want him dead is because he he's claiming he's made himself the son of God, which of course he was the son of God more the reason why Jesus didn't deserve this death because he literally was who he was claiming to be but at the end of the day they wanted him dead for blasphemy they were zealously doing this thinking that they were somehow doing God a favor not realizing they were actually fulfilling prophecy therefore when Pilate heard that saying he was more afraid so he heard wait Jesus is claiming to be the son of God and now Pilate's more afraid why is Pilate more afraid because there's a chance I'm killing the son of God. Pilate's probably thinking, if this man is the son of God, I'm actually killing the son of God. So Pilate's more afraid. The Bible says, verse nine, and went out again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Now, one commentator said, undoubtedly, this was the worst day of Pilate's life. Hearing that Jesus claimed to be the son of God sent his temperature up 20 degrees. Romans believed that gods came to earth and maybe Jesus might have been one of them. If that were the case, it was not Pilate's best interest to kill him. Earlier, Pilate's wife had a dream about Jesus and sent a message with, to him telling him have nothing to do with this innocent man. And he must have been thinking about her words. Now with the crowd chanting crucifixion, he could sense a riot coming and unable to make a firm decision. Pilate went back into the house to talk to Jesus and Jesus t wouldn't tell him where he was from so that Pilate knew if he was God or not. Again, Pilate's asking this thinking, where are you from? He's not saying like, what city are you from? We already, he already knows Jesus is from Nazareth. He's saying, where are you from? In other words, did you come from God? Cause remember the Romans believe that there were gods that had come and walked as men. So Pilate's asking, are you the son of God? Are you who you claim to be? So he's asking this, but Jesus had already told him who he was. And what was the point of Jesus repeating truth to Pilate when Pilate didn't act on it? Remember at the end of the day, this is a lose lose for Pilate. If he crucifies him, he's now killed the son of God. And if he lets him go, now there's a massive riot and a massive revolt. So there's no way for Pilate to win. And at the end of the day, Pilate was just being used all part of God's plan uh, for for Jesus to die and raise from the dead. And by the way, I forgot to announce that so we're doing communion at the end. So I have my communion here. If you need, get your elements, I just have a cracker, get some bread. We will be celebrating the end of the book of John with taking communion. I, I believe it's only fitting, it's something we should do. So just grab your bread, grab your whatever you have will work because um, we're gonna be taking communion at the end. And then look at verse 11, Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one that delivered me to you has the greater sin. Jesus is making it clear and reminding Pilate, my authority comes from above and your authority comes from above. You, you, Pilate, you have no power other than the power you've been given. And this still stands for politicians, for men of power, 
The Bible makes it clear there's no one in power that God has not allowed to be in power. The presidents, the kings, the rulers, the dictators are in power because God has allowed them, good or, whether you think that's good or bad. God has given power to all governing authorities and God, this is all part of God's plan. There wasn't, I want you to remember this. There was not one second in all of this we're going to see tonight where God was out of control. There was not one moment where God was not fully in control. And then look at verse 12. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, if you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. So now they're putting him into a dilemma. Pilate, if you let this guy go and word gets back to Caesar that a man is claiming to be the king when we know Caesar's the king, Caesar's the Lord, this is gonna be bad for you, Pilate. You potentially will lose your job and potentially Caesar might even order for your head. So Pilate again is like, I want to let him go. You see the wrestling in Pilate. I don't want to kill this man. He's innocent. And there's this battle and they go, now they start making it political. They said, if you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Verse 13. Again, a lot of this is just descriptive. I'm giving little commentary here and there. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement but the Hebrew Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold your king. But they cried out away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and they led Jesus away. So here's the leaders now, the religious leaders now saying, I would rather pledge my allegiance to Caesar then pledge my allegiance to really Jesus is the king. And Jesus literally is and was the king of the Jews. They were saying this in a derogatory term. And we're going to find out later, the Jewish people didn't even want Jesus to be called the king of the Jews, um, that they were actually mad about this. They said, we have no king but Caesar. And then they delivered him to be crucified. Again, absolutely t terrible death. I'm going to read a little bit about the crucifixion later and what it was like. But it was, it was the worst possible death that the Romans offered. The absolute worst most horrific, painful death that you could possibly inflict on a human being. Verse 17, and he, which is obviously Jesus, bearing his cross, went out to the place called the place of the skull, which is the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now, Pilate wrote a, a title and look at this. Everyone pay attention here and put it on the cross and the writing was. So there was a placard, a title on the cross. And this is what it said. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Note it, note here, the king of the Jews. Not that he claimed to be the king of the Jews, but Pilate says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And then look at what verse 20 here says. Then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So three languages it's written. And, the, and look how mad they get. Therefore, the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I've written, I have written. In other words, I'm not changing it. Okay, so they're mad because Pilate writes, to spite them, he writes king of the, the king of the Jews. They want him to write that Jesus claimed to be the king of the Jews, but Jesus wasn't the king. And Pilate is not changing, not changing his, uh, his wording on this. He's not. Now, in, in Jesus' day, condemned criminals carried their own crosses to the side of crucifixion. And although Jesus is normally pictured, we all think of him as the cross on his back and he's carrying the cross on his back, he would have usually held it on the horizontal cross beam. So it would have been, the horizontal cross beam would have been down his shoulder and he would have been dragging the cross, not carrying it as many things on his back, you know, hor like that way. And so they would take stakes in the ground at Golgotha. They would reuse these stakes that they would dig over and over again for different for different criminals and prisoners and then the victim was nailed to the cross beam on the ground so they would nail the victim on the ground they would lay it down put the victim down nail them to the cross first and then the soldiers would lift it up into the groove near the top of the stake and then the feet would be about two to four feet off the ground and that's where they would hang one commentator said the cross was the most disgraceful and one of the cruelest instruments of death ever invented the Romans would not allow a Roman citizen to be crucified, but they reserved crucifixion for slaves and foreigners or provincial provincials. The Jews customarily used stoning and never crucifixion. It was only the death of the greatest ignominy 
but the most extreme anguish, not, not just the greatest agony, but the most extreme anguish and suffering. And then listen to what this other commentator I found said. In Psalms 22, 16, we read, they pierced my hands and my feet. This is messianic Psalm and has always been regarded as such. And there's an amazing accuracy in what is proclaimed here. David wrote this a thousand years prior. And in that day, stoning was the method of capital punishment. David spoke of the Messiah's hands and feet being pierced. Again, a thousand years ago, David is prophesying this. So he speaks of the Messiah's hands being, uh, and feet being pierced under the influence of the spirit of God. He describes a manner of execution that was foreign to the people this day. So think about that. I never even thought of this. A thousand years prior, David's writing about crucifixion, which was not even around back then. This was completely unknown to the readers of that day. The period in which crucifixion was common, the common mode of execution was hundreds of years in the future. And in the time of the Romans who used this peculiar method, not only was the death described, but the rest of Psalms 22 relates the suffering accompanying his death. So I don't have the, I don't, I'm not going to give you guys the whole list, but there's literally hundreds of prophecies, thousands of years before Jesus came and died. Undeniably, Jesus is a real person, was a real person. Undeniably, even an atheist would say, yeah, Jesus was a real person. But the kicker is the thousand or the hundreds of prophecies about Jesus, Jesus fulfills every single one of them. And this is just one of the prophecies that Jesus is going to fulfill. Okay, and the, the religious people are mad because they want it to be written again that Jesus claimed to be king of the Jews, but Pilate decided to leave the sign as it was. Jesus hung in a public place where many of those that were coming for Passover can come and read the sign, furthering the humiliation. And as a revenge for, again, his political defeat, Pilate posts this in three different languages to make sure that everyone can see, labeling the beaten, crucified man as the king of the Jews. In turn, think about this, would embarrass the religious leaders. So that's Pilate's goal is, I'm going to embarrass these religious leaders because look at their king, is over there on the cross and the, and the craziest part is they are the ones that wanted him on that cross they wanted him to be up on that cross verse 23 then the soldiers when they crucified jesus took his garments and made four parts to each soldier a part and also the tunic now the tunic was without seam woven from the woven from the top in one piece they said therefore among themselves let us not tear it but let's cast lots for it whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled so john says even the soldiers, look at this, are fulfilling scripture. So the scripture might be fulfilled. They divided my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. So these soldiers, part of their pay is they would get the victim's belongings. So instead of tearing it into four pieces, one for each soldier, they decided to gamble for Jesus's covering and Jesus's robes, not realizing they're fulfilling the prophecies. So understand the world fulfills prophecy, the tribulation, the antichrist, the false prophet, the beast, everything in the book of revelation will be fulfilled by the world will be fulfilled that the world does not realizing that even the world will fulfill the prophecies of God. Well, what does that matter? It matters because God is in complete control. Nothing is happening by random. Nothing is happening outside of God's governing and order. And so if you're in that will of God and you're following God, let this be a word for you that God will even use your enemies to fulfill the prophecies in your life. You might have a prophetic word that you're going to do something great. You don't even know how you're going to get it done. God can even use the world to fulfill prophecy. And in this case, they are not realizing what they're doing, but God in his sovereignty is in control. And God is fulfilling prophecy even right here. So don't be shocked when God uses someone to fulfill prophecy. Don't be surprised when God uses someone in your life to fulfill prophecy, even if they're not a believer. Verse 25. We got to move here because we got still two more chapters. Now they're stood by the cross. Now, so let's see who's at the cross of Jesus. His mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So we have Jesus' mother, Mary. Okay, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene, when G Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved, which is John standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. This is Jesus from the cross. Many people don't know this. He's from the cross and he's looking down saying, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, which is John, 
Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Okay. Few of Jesus' followers stuck around during the crucifixion. And John mentions only five of them. And then again, that's Jesus' mother, his aunt Salome, the wife of Zebedee, the mother of John, who again is the writer of this book, James, uh, Mary, the wife of Clopas, who is the mother of James and the younger and uh, Joseph, and then Mary Magdalene and John the author. So five total, John says are here. All the other disciples are nowhere to be found. And in the midst of all the pain and the agony, Jesus thinks about his mother. And part of honoring your mother or father in those days was providing for them. And since Jesus was not going to be around, obviously Jesus is on the cross dying. He asked John to take care of her. And so while hanging on the cross, he's thinking of his mother and he's asking John to take care of his mother. Now there's seven things I want to go over. Seven things recorded that Jesus says well on the cross. Seven things. Now John only records three of them, but I'm going to give you the references for all seven of them. So if you're taking notes, if you're a student, you should be taking notes. I'm going to give you the seven things here. Number one, these are seven things he said on the cross that are recorded in scripture. Of course, he could have said more. They just weren't recorded. Number one, father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's on the cross. Jesus is saying, father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that's Luke 23, 34. Let that be in your head whenever you struggle to forgive somebody. They're crucifying Jesus and he's asking the father to forgive the ones that are killing him while he's on the cross. So Jesus forgives those that are killing him, including the Roman soldiers that nailed him to the cross, including the Jewish leaders that led him to arrest and including Pilate who ordered the crucifixion. That's Luke 23, 34. Number two, he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And that's Luke 23, 43. Now, one of the two thieves who was crucified next to Jesus put his faith in Jesus as savior while he's on the cross. And as a result, Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Okay, so that's number two. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Number three, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. That's John 19, 26. We just read that. So while he's dying, he takes care of his mother by committing her to John to make sure she's taken care of. Number four, this is a really, really uh, hard one here. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's something Jesus said to the father on the cross. That's Matthew 27, 46. So on the cross, remember, Jesus is taking on all the sins of the world. And because God is holy and God can't look upon sin, Jesus was separated spiritually from the father during that time. For a brief moment, Jesus is separated from the father. And then Jesus cries out to the father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this question was a fulfillment of a prophecy in Psalms chapter 22, verse one. That's number four. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Number five, Jesus said, I thirst. That's John 19, 28. We're about to see that. After three hours of him hanging in the sun, Jesus, of course, would be extremely parched, could barely talk. And although he didn't need the pain deadening wine, because I'll talk about that in a minute, they would give them basically wine before to, to numb some of the pain of crucifixion. Jesus didn't take that wine, but he uttered, I thirst to fulfill the prophecy in Psalm 69, 21. So these are prophecy fulfilling things. All the prophecies written, not one did he miss. He fulfills every single prophecy that is written there. Number six, it is finished. That's something he said in John 19, 30. We're about to see that. This was a cry of victory. Jesus had completed the payment for our sins. Finished, paid in full, the check cleared, written the check, it's cleared, and this is a full payment. And then number seven, this is Luke 23, 46. Jesus says, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. So as he, as he breathed his last breath, Jesus commits his spirit to the Father. And this is proving that nobody forced Jesus to die. Jesus voluntarily died. He gave up his life for us. So let's now go back to, let's see, this screen. And those are the seven things he said in the verses. And again, I know it's go I go fast, but I got a lot to cover, a lot to cover, and you guys can rewind. Verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing all things were now accomplished, that the scripture may be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And we just read it. We just talked about that. Now, a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So here we have, there's a wine they would mix before the crucifixion, a painkiller type of wine heavy strength they would give this to the victims jesus denied that he did not take that wine 
Um, he endured the full excruciating agony of hanging on that cross, did not take the wine. Nearing the end, this was a fulfillment of prophecy of him saying, I thirst, and then them fastening that sour wine. This Again, this was not wine to take away pain. This was a, a, a spoiled sour wine that they would give to Jesus to fulfill that prophecy. One uh, commentator said, that wasn't enough wine to quench his thirst after hanging on the cross for three hours, but it was enough for him to, to uh, permit him to shout a victory cry, it is finished. At 3 p.m., the Greek word for this phrase means a debt is paid in full. Something is accomplished and the assigned work is completed. Nothing else needed to be done for our salvation from sin. Jesus' death on the cross fulfilled all the predictions about his death and completed, man, I feel the Holy Spirit on this, completed the payment for our sins. Then he voluntarily gave up his life. Jesus was in control of his death, even to his final breath. So again, Jesus giving up his life, giving up his life. No one took it from him. Verse 31. And we've seen that before as well. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was the high, was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken. So they want Pilate to break the legs of all three men on the crosses because they don't want him hanging up there. They want to expedite their death. Okay. But look what it says here. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. So Jesus was the only one that was dead. The other two were still alive. So they didn't break Jesus's legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that you may believe for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, and another scripture says they shall look on him who they pierce again, more fulfillment of prophecy. But what's important to note is during the Passover, the lamb that was for the Passover, the lamb could not have any broken bones or the sacrifice wasn't accepted. This was prophecy that Jesus died before they came to break his bones. Because again, if the lamb's bones were broken, the sacrifice was invalid. But Jesus, the perfect lamb, had no broken bones. This was all part of God's prophetic timeline. But also, we know this was part of prophecy. But I want, I want, to, just, I want to read this historian that I found that's describing the crucifixion to give you a better picture of what this was like. He said this, while the cross beam was on the ground, the crucifixion victim's hands or wrists were nailed in place with heavy square nails without pulling the arms too tight. So they didn't tighten the arms when they put them on the cross. And listen to this. Once the cross beam was put in place on a stake, the person's left foot was pressed against the right foot with the toes forced downward. A nail was driven through both the arches in the feet, leaving the knees flexed. Okay, so they would drive the nails through the arches of the feet and the knees would be flexed. This is a historian. As the victim would hang, he sagged, causing pressure on the nerves and excruciating pain that would shoot through the fingers and the arms. It was like a fire that would be exploding in the brain. To relieve the pain, the victim would have to push himself up. The extra weight on the nail in his feet tore the nerves in his feet, causing more exploding pain. His arms tired would cramp, producing a throbbing muscle pain and preventing him from pushing himself up. He could barely breathe as he tried to raise himself again to draw air, taking some in, but not able to exhale the air. So carbon dioxide would build up in the victim's lungs and in the bloodstream, temporarily relieving the arm cramps and allowing him to pull himself up to breathe. The victim would endure hours of this cycle of pain, tearing the tissues from the back each time he moved up and down on the rough wood. Slowly, the sac around the heart would fill with fluid, compressing the heart and causing a crushing chest pain. Finally, they would reach the critical stage and after hours, that one that would hang on the cross would finally die. Part of the horror of the crucifixions that the Romans really invented was a long drawn out death. Since it was disrespectful for the Jewish people to leave a dead body hanging on Sabbath, something had to be done to make sure these men were down before sundown when the Sabbath began. The holy day made it even more urgent to clear the crosses so the Jewish leaders asked Pilate to hasten to death by having the soldiers break the victim's legs. This was normal procedure to keep them from pushing up and breathing longer. Okay, so this guy's saying it was normal to break their legs so they couldn't push up and breathe longer. Okay, with broken legs, they would suffocate in their own body fluids. So that, again, this is absolutely horrific. It's, it's, 
it's disgusting, it's demonic the way the Romans invented this, but they would actually die, once their legs were broken, they would actually die by suffocating on their body fluids, which is, again, a horrific, this was the worst way to die. It was calculated that they would do this to prisoners and criminals, and the Roman people were not crucified. It was so bad, the Roman people said, we don't care how bad they are, we're not gonna crucify the Romans. Part of the reason they didn't break his bones, because if the lamb's bones were broken, the sacrifice was not accepted. So it's all part of the prophecy that would be fulfilled. And then John says here, of course, at the end, um, that this is all true. He's telling the truth so that you may believe. John, an eyewitness, this is not secondhand information. John's an eyewitness to all of this. And let's go to verse 38 here. And we gotta, we gotta start moving a little bit quicker. After this, Joseph of Arimathea became a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for the fear of the Jews. He asked Pilate that he might take the body of Jesus and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus, okay? Um, and Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also bringing a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about 100 pounds. Okay, so Joseph of, of Arimathea came with Nicodemus, and now they're taking Jesus' body with myrrh and alloys, again, about 100 pounds of myrrh and alloys. Verse 40, then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. And then verse 42 says, So there they laid Jesus because the Jews' preparation day, the tomb was nearby. Now, this right here, the story would be over. Any regular person, any normal guy that was crucified, any criminal that would die, they would bury them. They would put them in the tomb. Again, it's not talking about like burying like in the ground, but these were in tombs, usually in the side of a cave or the side of a, a stone wall. This story's over. The story's done. We can end it. Jesus was a great revolutionary, but Jesus is the only person in history where the story doesn't end when he dies. The story actually just gets better. So when Jesus dies, as we're going to continue, the whole thing that we hitch our wagon to, the whole thing that we tie our faith to, Paul said if Jesus didn't raise, everything would be in vain because there's a but to the story. It's not over. Jesus died. He's buried. The tomb is ready. A hundred pounds of alloy and myrrh and different things. But the story doesn't end because let's jump directly into verse or chapter 20 here and see some of the most beautiful portion in all of scripture. This is like, y'all, this is our chapter. This is our Super Bowl chapter. Now the and we're just going to read through it together. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene. Remember Mary Magdalene, whom Jesus cast how many demons out of? Somebody type in the chat. How many demons did Jesus cast out of Mary Magdalene? I believe it was seven, seven or nine, but I believe it was seven. So just remember the person that Jesus is revealing himself to first was a a woman. Oh, I know a lot of the you know a lot of the reformed guys, the Calvinists, they don't like that. You know, ladies, you just got to. Don't be talking up in church. They believe that, but I don't believe that. But the first person was a female and also not just a female, but had seven demons that were cast out that Jesus cast out of her. So she's a female and she's got a testimony, y'all. She's got a testimony. So she goes out to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. The stones, stones rolled away. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've laid him. So she thinks somebody stole Jesus out of the tomb. Okay, remember, they don't know what's going on. They know Jesus was saying, I'm coming back. I'm going to go, but then you're going to see me again. But they, they're all hiding. They all think this is the story over. The, this is the defeat here. Peter therefore went out with the other disciples and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together. So now she goes and tells them the tomb's empty and, and they start, Peter and the other disciples start running to the tomb. So they both ran together, verse 4. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down, looking and saw the fine linen clothing, clothing laying there, lying there. Look at this. Yet he did not go in. This is incredible. Then Simon Peter came following him and went to the tomb and saw the linen clothes laying there and the hank handkerchief, uh, the handkerchief, uh, I can't say the word, handkerchief. <laughs> I don't know why I can't say that word. The handkerchief that had been around his head, not laying with the linen clothings, but look at this, folded together in a place by itself. And that translates to basically the thing that they wrapped around his head after he was dead, neatly folded. That's what it translates to. It was neatly folded there, right there on the stone. 
Then the other disciples who came to the tomb first went in also and saw and believed, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So they didn't understand exactly what he meant when he was going to rise again. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Incredible. So they they could have thought somebody stole the body. But to prove the body wasn't stolen, because that was a myth that would go around. Someone stole the body, all this stuff. To prove the body wasn't stolen, Jesus doesn't just raise from the dead. Jesus made his bed. I don't know what else to say that. He got out of the tomb, got up from the tomb, defeated death, hell, and the grave, conquered death, and then goes, let me fold up my clothes here. Folds his clothes. Now, there was grave robbers in those days. It was not uncommon for tombs to be robbed. That's a whole nother story. But when they would rob a grave, they would leave all the clothes everywhere. They would make a mess. So this was further proof, neatly folded clothes was for further proof that no nobody robbed this grave. Nobody robbed this grave. Jesus raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 10, the disciples went back to their homes. Okay, now look at what happens here. Verse 11, I love this. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. So Mary Magdalene, she's there. First one, no one else is around. She sees him in the morning, runs back. It's the other disciples. They all go home again. They don't know what to do. They're like, well, I guess the tomb's empty. I can imagine the conversation. And I'm not gonna, I don't wanna read too much into the text. I don't wanna add my thing. I'm just imagining what their conversation could have been like running around talking about the tomb is empty. All the stuff he said about coming back is, is likely true. I, I mean, just imagine the excitement here. And then for us, hindsight, this is the most exciting chapter literally in the Bible. This is everything here. But Mary, so everyone goes home. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping and she wept, stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had laid. So here she is now and two angels appear in the tomb. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And, she, and, and again, it just sounds like a dumb question. Like, what do you mean? Why am I weeping? Like the guy I've been following, I gave everything to is gone. He's gone. He died. They just killed him. But look what they say here. She said to them, because they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. So she still thinks, and, and so this shows us they're still thinking that somebody maybe took him or moved him or maybe it was Nicodemus. We don't know. Verse 14. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. So she says it, turns around, and there's Jesus right there at the foot, at the entrance of the tomb. She's in there with the angels. Boom, there's Jesus standing there. But she didn't know it was him. And we see this all throughout scripture. Jesus has a way of hiding himself where people are talking to him, but they don't know it's him. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She's supposing him to be the gardener. Said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and, I'll, and, I'll, and I will take him away. So she doesn't know it's Jesus. She thinks it's the gardener. And then Jesus says to, says to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Now I won't get into the theology about the other saints that M Matthew talks about were walking around the earth and did Jesus go to hell or not? I'll make a separate video on all of that. Did he go to hell? What does he mean? He hasn't ascended yet. Where was he? Why was there saints literally walking around the city, saints of old? I'll do another video explaining all of that because it's much deeper than I have time to explain here right now, but just take it for what it was. He said, I am ascending to my father and your father. So he had not ascended to the father yet, but, he, but of course he was raised from the dead at this point. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she'd seen the Lord and that she'd sp and he'd spoken these things to her. Then the same day, verse 19, at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. So they're hiding because they're afraid of the Jews. And this is New King James Version. They're, they have fear of the Jews. Where am I at? Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. So here comes Jesus showing up in the midst of them saying, peace be with you, which was a customary greeting that Jesus gave other times in scriptures. When he had said this, he showed his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the father has sent me. And this is where I really, I'm going to highlight this whole thing here. As the father sent me, actually, let's do this. As the father sent me, I also send you. And somebody write that down, underline it, highlight in your Bible, note this, okay? Because this is, this is for you too. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, 
receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Okay. I want to ask you guys a question. Jesus says, as the Father sent me. Now, how did the Father send Jesus? The Father sent Jesus to proclaim the good news, preach and declare repentance, pray for those that were sick in body. Remember when Jesus prays for the sick? He says, I'm only doing what the Father sent me to do. I'm only doing what I see the Father do. Do you guys remember this? When Jesus cast out demons, he said, I only do what I see the Father do. I do it by the Spirit of God. The Father is the one telling me to do this. Everything Jesus did was because the Father sent him to do. Now that I'm leaving, I'm raised from the dead, but I'm going to be going back to the Father. As the Father sent me to proclaim the gospel, to pray for the sick, to drive out devils, fill in the blank. Everything Jesus did, I now am going to send you. Now, this makes me scratch my head a bit, but a lot of people say, well, he never told us to cast out devils. He never told us to heal the sick. We're not supposed to do the works that Jesus did. Well, we know that's not true because John 14, Jesus explicitly said, the same works I've done, you will do an even greater. So like, you're just a liar if you say that. Jesus is truth, you're not. Let every man be a liar and what Jesus say be true. But here we are now, and Jesus is saying, as the Father sent me, I am now also, I also send you. So now you go preach to the world. Now you go cast out devils. You go lay hands on the sick. You go bring the good news to this generation. And when he said this, let's just take the text plainly. Okay, let's, let's just follow along here. Very plain. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Do you, let me know in the chat because I have the chat in front of me. Did they receive the Holy Spirit right here? Because it sounds like they did. There's, there's some Bible teachers that say they didn't receive the Holy Ghost till Pentecost. Pentecost was a second baptism for some of the disciples. And we know because the Bible says, don't be drunk on wine, but be continually filled with the Holy Spirit, meaning you can be baptized more than once. So I would say yes. How could you read this and say, unless you interpret it and have, in my opinion, let me just, my humble opinion, unless you have some other interpretation that I don't see, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, did they not receive the Holy Spirit? Did they close their mouth and no, we're not going to receive it? Jesus breathes on the disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. I would conclude they received the Holy Spirit there. And then in Acts, some of them got filled again. And we know they kept getting filled because the Bible would say later that the place would shake. The place would shake as they prayed and there would be a way it would happen again. So there was a continual filling, just like you could be drunk on wine every day. Also, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I don't know how you could, you know, now maybe a cessationist because they, they're really good at pretzeling up the scripture and turning the scripture into, you know, a pretzel and doing theological gymnastics to try to get the Bible to say that the gifts aren't for today, miracles aren't for today. You got to really do a lot to be able to make the Bible say what you want it to say, that God's not moving to, anymore today, which is just a bizarre take. But to me, it seems very clear. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, and Luke has a parallel what, and we could look at it another time. Now this, I'm going to be 100% honest. I fully don't understand this. And I'm honest when I say that. And no one, no one has a good interpretation for this. I've read all of them. I've researched the commentaries. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain them, they are retained. Okay. Now, I, I have here a whole article I was going to read. I'm not going to read it. A whole article, basically, the, for the sake of time, because I'm almost an hour in and I still have another chapter. Basically, the article says, of course, we don't have the power to forgive sin, but we've been given the message of forgiveness of sin, which I would agree with that take. That's the position I would take. I don't take the position of, I'm going to go around forgiving people of their sins, because we don't see that as part of the calling or the commandment of Jesus to the disciples. So I would stick with, hey, what he's saying here as we've been given the, the message of forgiveness, the message that Jesus, I'm his ambassador, but Jesus is the one that forgives sins, not me. But again, this is a very big scripture, lots of contention, lots of debate in the Christian community, and you can find a whole list of articles saying a whole bunch of different things. I would just take it plainly as, okay, we've been given the ministry of forgiveness and reconciliation that we can, you know, Preach the message of forgiveness that God tonight can forgive you of your sins, but I won't get into the weeds here and start saying, because I mean, if you read it, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. Uh, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Again, 
not going to create a theology on this, not going to start teaching that we should forgive people's sins and that we're, you know, like the Catholics would say, you need the Father to forgive you in confession. We're not doing all that. God is the one that forgives. Jesus is the one I go to. I don't go to a person, but it is an interesting thing to study and to look into. I would say we've been given the message of forgiveness because the Bible makes it clear in 2 Corinthians 5, 19 or 5, 20, off the top of my head that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation as Christ's ambassadors. We are pleading with people, come back to God as if God was speaking through us, calling people back to him. So God speaks through us to reconcile people back to himself, but God uses us as his ambassadors. That's where I would take it because it seems to be, it's, it's harmonious with what Paul preached and you know, just going through the whole scripture. Verse 24. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So Thomas wasn't there when he first came. The other disciple said, we have seen the Lord. <clears throat> Give me one second. I have an ear infection, so my ear is uh, popping like all over the place and all weird. So I had to just do that really quick to just get it to stop doing that. It's distracting me. So he said to them, unless I see hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Verse 26. And after eight day, days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst of them. I love this. Jesus came, the door being shut, stood in the midst of them, meaning he appeared. Okay, you can say he teleported, he translated, he walked through the wall, however you want to say it. He appeared to them while the doors were shut and said, peace to you. And th then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thank you, Lord. Help me. This is something you need to write down and something you need to pray. Lord, help me to not be unbelieving, but be believing. I don't want to be a skeptic. I don't want to be a skeptic. I don't want to see something. And I, at times, find myself watching, maybe it's a video or a testimony. I'm like, there's a, there's sometimes a seed of doubt. I'm like, Lord, I don't want to be unbelieving. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't, I don't want to be doubting what you're doing. If you're doing it, help me believe God. Help me not be unbelieving. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Then G Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen and believe. So there's something about believing, not seeing the miracle, not seeing the deliverance, not seeing what others have seen, but still believing. Not everybody has seen a healing miracle. Not everybody has seen a deliverance. Like I've seen it with my eyes. I... I have no choice but to believe. I, I, it would be harder for me to live in unbelief than belief. But Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And again, he's not, I'm not taking this saying about miracles and deliverance. That does play part of it. But what he's saying here is, not everyone's going to see me like in that way. Not everyone's going to hear me. Millions will hear the gospel but not see Jesus like in a real way. So this is a prophetic statement. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. We haven't seen Jesus in that physical way, yet we believe. And then look at verse 30. And truly, Jesus did many other signs. Give me one second. I got to check something here. I just got to make sure that we're up still on Facebook because people are saying that we're having difficulty. No, we're still up. Barely 100 people on Facebook. We, are, If you guys don't know, our account is restricted on Facebook. So we have 90 days where our Facebook will not show our videos to anybody, but it's all good. We'll get over it. Verse 30. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. What are the signs? We don't know. We don't know what signs he did, but he did many other signs there with the disciples. And I would love to know someday in heaven, what were those signs you did with the disciples? But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Okay, we're almost done here. We have about 25 more verses. Verse tw chapter 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in, the sa and in this way, he showed himself Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana, uh, of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. Okay, so Simon, I have a whole sermon on this. It's hard not to preach sometimes during these, because I have sermons on these uh, topics. But Simon basically says, I'm going back to my old life. Okay, Jesus has died. He resurrected. Cool but I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. So he goes back to the thing Jesus called him out of. Remember, Jesus called them away from fishing for fish. Now they're going to be fishers of men. But Peter decides to go back to his old, shall I say, life, his old profession, his old way of doing things, which happens often when people get set on fire. 
they go back to normal. He wasn't going back to sin. He was going back to normalcy. He was going back to just work, just business as usual. Should, should be out like he did on the book of Acts, preaching, being that disciple, but he goes back to his, his old job. They said to him, we're going to go with you also. Normalcy is contagious. Preach. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Because when you go back to what God called you out of, you're not going to produce what you think you're going to produce. God called me out of law enforcement, said Isaiah, you're not going to be a deputy sheriff like you're trying to become. So if I leave preaching and try to go become a deputy sheriff right now, I could almost be sure I wouldn't get the job. I could almost be sure I wouldn't be successful in any career because God called me out of that. I don't want to go back to what God called me out of because it will produce, amen, nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said, children, have you any food? They answered, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast and now they were not, they were not able to draw it up because the multitude of fish. Therefore, the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard this, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish, which you just caught. Simon hearing Jesus, remember the guy that he's denied, the guy that he's betrayed, jumps out of the boat and swims to Jesus. Verse 11, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. So what do we see here, chat? With Jesus, someone said, let him cook. <laughs> Literally, with Jesus, you catch nothing. But when you're doing what Jesus says to do, go do this, cast your net on the other side, become a preacher, start a YouTube channel, whatever it is. When Jesus says to do it, glorious results. People are like, how did you grow so much on YouTube and get so many views and followers? I'll tell you how, are you guys ready for the secret? Jesus told me to do it. In 2019, towards the end of the year, or about, uh, what, May, towards the end of the year, July-ish, Jesus told me and my pastor, my uncle, my right-hand person, you guys need to go online, you need to start a channel, you need to get video cameras. You, we didn't know, we were like, what, why? I'm traveling, I'm preaching, I'm senior pastoring a church. You guys didn't know I was senior pastoring a church for a decade. Why am I going to be online? I don't wanna live stream, I don't wanna talk in front of these cameras. There's no one even here, I'm in my office. But Jesus said, do it, Isaiah. Now, fast forward three years, we have almost 2 million followers online and we've reached 200 million people last year. This year, we're projected to reach over 300 million people with the gospel. How? How? Because Jesus said, Isaiah, cast your net on the other side. And I obeyed him. I was casting my net on one side and getting no results. And he says, cast on the other side, and I just obeyed. That's how the channel grew. That's how the people watch. That's why, because I'm obedient to Jesus. Not my doing, nothing I can do. Now, of course, I worked hard. I did all the stuff. But in 2019, before the pandemic, God prepared us and said, do this, and gave us a word before even anything happened. And God is faithful. And so when you obey God, you're going to catch fish. You're going to have results. You're going to have the fire. You're going to be nourished. You're going to have food to eat. But when you don't obey him, this is what you get. Uh, let's see. Where is it at? I'm going fishing. This is what you get. Let me highlight it. Nothing. I don't know why I don't have anything. Because you haven't listened to Jesus. Because you haven't been obedient to his word and what he said to do. When he, when he tells you, when there's a vision, he'll give you the provision. Simon Peter went, and there's hard work involved, of course. It takes work to fish. Friend, I, I spent hundreds of hours learning about thumbnails and titles and SEO and algorithms and CTR and uh, watch time and average duration, all of that. The fishing takes work, but God's the one telling me to do it, so I don't mind putting in the work. We don't sit around going, well, God gave me a word, I'm gonna reach millions of people. I put the work in. I press record, I get the cameras, I set up the studio, I do what God, I do the work. And then I say, here God, I'm giving you something to work with, and then God does what he does best. And that is shows up and shows off. Verse 11. Drag the net. Okay, we did that. Thir 13. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. I like how it makes it clear. John says this is the third time he showed up to us. Verse 15. 
So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, then tend my sheep. He said a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said, said to him, excuse me, a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, excuse me, one second. Sorry, guys, I have all this pressure in my ears and it's making me like, oh, okay. Where was I? A third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken, he said to him, follow me. Three times. Are you guys getting why he said it? Three times, you guessed it, because he denied Jesus three times. So because he denied Jesus three times, he would now commit himself to Jesus three times. Now, Jesus prophesied his death because Peter would be crucified on a cross like Jesus. Jesus was prophesying how Peter would die. Peter would be crucified on a cross except for the caveat that Peter said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like you, like my Savior. Crucify me upside down. So they actually put uh, Peter on a cross upside down. That's how he died. And it was all prophesied here. And here we are towards the very end. And I have the whole book of Acts on YouTube already, verse by verse. You can go check that out. But let's let's finish strong here. Verse 20. Then Peter, turn, turning around, saw the disciples whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? But Jesus said, if, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if I will remain till I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that this testimony is true. Of course, John is talking about himself here. And I want you to note this. This is my, this is my favorite. And it's the last way we close. And we're going to close you know, our six-month journey right here and celebrate praise the lord and we're going to celebrate that with taking communion and praying um this has been a six month journey guys six months we've been doing this here we are the 1700 of you thank you for being here because we are closing out the book of john after started this december 12th and we were able to get to here so praise the lord now we're in may verse 25 look at this this is a game changer and there are also many other things that jesus did which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would have been written. Amen. So what John closes with is there is so much more that Jesus did that we don't even know. So much more in scripture that Jesus did that we're not even aware of. And if everything he did was written, he says, I suppose the world can contain the books written. And that, ladies and gentlemen is the book of john we finished the first gospel in our our long pursuit our long journey let's get some ones in the chat i probably should have had some like cool music let's get some confetti here we're done ladies and gentlemen i'm gonna take a, a probably a couple weeks break from the verse by verse and do some topical teachings and other content like that but we are done we are done yes get some ones get some hallelujahs get some praise the lord celebrate celebrate thank you lord Oh, now my stream's lagging. Don't do that. The devil is a liar. Apparently, my stream doesn't like the confetti because it lagged out my whole stream. Oh, you know what? I have I have a real confetti right here. Should we pop it? I'm scared. I'm scared. Yay, we did it. Goodness. What in the world? I did not know that was so loud. Dude, that had gunpowder coming out of it. Oh, that is going to be a mess to clean up. I kid you not, my ears are ringing right now. Oh, dude. What in the world? I can't even hear right now. I have an ear infection. I just popped my other ear. <laughs> that was, was that loud to you guys? That was literally so loud. There was gunpowder coming out of that thing. What in the world? What company is this? Oh, this is like a legit firework. Jake celebration. <laughs> I was not ready for that. Oh, my ears are ringing. I think I just fixed my ear. I did not think that was going to make that big of a mess, but that's going to be interesting to clean, but it's okay. Praise the Lord, we are done. Now let us celebrate as my ear still rings. Let us now celebrate with communion. Praise the Lord.
Praise the Lord. Someone said bring out Carl to celebrate. There you go. That was so loud. It wasn't loud for you guys, dude. That was so loud. I want to watch it on the replay. I'm pretty sure that peaked out my whole thing. That was literally so loud. It busted my eardrum. My ear is ringing right now. There's literally smoke coming out of that. Okay. Let's take our communion here. I've got, I got disoriented. I just, ba I basically just flash banged myself. I'm disoriented now. I literally am disoriented. That was so loud. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Who is here since day, the start of the series? I'm all messed up, man. Ear ringing, ear infection, allergies. I got a humidifier back here. What is going on here? Help me, Lord. Summer is coming. All right, let's take communion. Get your stuff out. Let's take communion here. Praise the Lord. The celebration. We finished. We finished. Why do we have a bird? Ah, uh, we don't know. It's just, it's our pet bird. I have some juice here. Get your stuff out. And then I have a cracker and we're going to take communion. Let me read you a few verses here. As we take communion. I'm glad you laughed at that because my ears are still ringing. I thought that was a drive-by for a second out here. Okay. Communion. What is communion? If you're new, communion is simply a symbolic way to remind ourselves of what Jesus did sacrificially for us on the cross. And what better time to do it? I have confetti literally every inch of my desk and laptop and all over my feet and legs and everything. Okay. It is a symbolic way to remind ourselves of Christ's sacrificial death that we just read about on the cross. It's something we're commanded to do. The breaking of the bread is speaking of Christ's broken body on the cross, which again, we just talked about. And the drinking of the cup has to do with the Christ's blood, which we are now forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Communion was originally celebrated in Exodus chapter 12, basically when God protected the children of Israel from the plagues and from the angel of death that would pass over. They would put blood over the doorpost and the angel would pass over. Get it? Pass over. So this is what we are doing. But now we know that Jesus made a new promise in Luke chapter 22, verse 19. While you get your stuff, guys, mods will answer your questions. You can use water if you need to. Someone said, I don't have anything. Just get some water. It's symbolic. It's symbolic. Get whatever you need to get. Uh, I have a cracker and some juice, but you can, you can use water. It's symbolic. So you don't need to have anything special. Okay. Luke twenty two nineteen 19 says he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way after the supper, he took the cup saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So this is the new covenant Jesus gives us. Why is there still confetti falling from the sky? What is going on here? Now, before we do this, I want to make sure we examine ourselves. This is in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man should examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and sick and a number of you have died. So what they were doing was they were using the, the bread supper to basically uh overeat so they're starving people in the city and they're using the passover supper to overeat while people were literally starving outside they were gorging themselves on the lord's supper and so paul's addressing that and saying you need to examine yourselves don't don't just take communion in an unworthy manner and just be overeating as take you take communion because they're starving people out there and you guys are overeating you're drinking you're getting drunk you're overeating you're drinking judgment on yourself so we've turned this into like if there's sin in your life you can't take communion that's not what was happening they were abusing communion when Paul wrote this to them in the book of Corinthians to the church of Corinth. But we still should examine our hearts right now, take it seriously, and again, take this going like, okay, Lord, thank you for what you did. This is a reflection of what you did on the cross. This is holy. And so let's just pray a quick prayer of repentance. Let's ask the Lord to examine our hearts. Lord, I just pray tonight, God, that you would examine our hearts, Lord. I pray, God, if there's any sin in our heart, you would point it out as David prayed. If there's any sin in me, I pray you would point it out, God. If there's anything in my life that offends you, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would have your way. I pray that your Holy Spirit would just bring conviction over us. I repent of any sin known or unknown in my life. God, if there's any sin in my life, I just turn from it, Lord. I repent of it. I just pray, Lord, right now you'd forgive me. You'd wash me and you'd cleanse me. Lord, that before I take this, I want to take this in a worthy manner. I want to be straight before you, Lord, with no sin in my life, no compromise. So I just pray, Lord, right now that we'd examine our hearts. We'd examine our hearts right now. Destiny said, I'm 17. I'm ready to follow Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord, Destiny. Okay, so now we've examined ourselves. Let's get our bread out. 
A lot of you, this is your first time, so I'm going to walk you through it. So now let's all take our bread out and just hold that in our hand while I read you this. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I see, receive from the Lord, that's what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, right here, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we're doing this as the body of Jesus in remembrance. Go ahead and eat your bread or your cracker, whatever you have. Go ahead and do that now. Okay, now that you had your bread or your cracker, I'm going to read you 1 Corinthians 11, 25. In the same way, he took the cup also. So here I have just some juice here. You could have whatever it is you have. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 25. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I don't know how this confetti is getting up in the air, but I just got hit in the head with a piece of confetti as I'm doing communion here, so that's not good. Okay, so take this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So you can now drink. Um, this is, represents the blood of Jesus. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I apologize, guys, for the confetti hitting me while I'm trying to be serious and take communion. I don't know how it's somehow getting back up in the air and then just circulating in the room. All right, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let me say that again. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, which is what we've done tonight. We've preached the message of Jesus. We've pleaded the blood of Jesus. We've prayed for forgiveness. We've done communion. And now, Father, we just thank you for what you've done for us, God. We thank you for what you did on the cross. I just pray, Lord, that we would every single day appreciate appreciate what you've done on the cross for us lord appreciate god the work that you've done thank you jesus thank you jesus for all that you've done for us thank you for healing us lord thank you for delivering. come on right now just thank him i just feel a moment we always pray for deliverance and healing and all that but how often do we pr we just thank him lord we thank you for what you've done for us we glorify you jesus come on just thank him Thank you for giving us a family. Thank you for healing our bodies. Thank you for delivering us. Thank you for restoring us. Thank you for renewing us, God. We worship you, God. We praise you tonight. We glorify your holy name. You are worthy, Jesus. Come on, thank him right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for healing me, delivering me, giving me a family, God, giving me a new mind, a new heart, a new spirit. We glorify you tonight. We honor you. Thank you, Jesus, for helping me through the book of John, God. Thank you for helping me with this accomplishment for your glory, for your honor. We thank you, Jesus, for empowering us with the Holy Spirit and your anointing. Thank you, Lord. I know the stream's cutting in and out here, guys, but just stay with me. Thank you, Jesus. We honor you. We bless you. We glorify your holy name in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. If you guys want to partner with us, I encourage you tonight to give. Again, we're not beggars, we're believers. This was all free. No, no money is required. We have 1,300 videos for free. But if you are blessed and you want to give, you can give there. I've missed you guys. I've missed you guys. I've missed being live. I've missed being with you. Um, it's been, what, 12 days. And so I miss you guys. If you want to give, you can. You can scan the QR code. We do need guys, you guys to partner with us. Monthly partner. You know, we have more people that end up canceling then they do sign up and it kind of just is a revolving door of people canceling every month and signing up every month it's a revolving door so we constantly need new people to partner with us help us so we can keep doing this full time so we never have to charge for content the goal is to never charge for content that's the goal okay we've been at this thing for uh three over three years now we're on our fourth year we started early 20 january of 2020 we did 2020 2021 2022 now we're in 2023 we're on our fourth year of streaming full-time and we've never had to charge for content and we pray that we never will so you guys make this possible you guys give us the ability to continue doing this and all that and i know facebook the remnant there if you're on facebook you should move over to youtube our account is fully restricted we have a 90-day ban for praying for the sick okay we literally had a video i kid you not i have a video of me praying for those i said hey if you're sick in body i want to pray for you and i prayed a, a verse psalms 103 it was a 30 second video Facebook deleted it and get, put me on a 90 day ban said we're not going to show your content to anybody for 90 days so it hurts because we're losing like 
almost a thousand viewers every stream now. It feels so bad, but it is what it is. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Not pray for the sick? It's ridiculous. So yeah, we're on 90 days. Our count is restricted is what they call it. And basically when I post videos now, I get like 500 views and we were getting like 100,000, a million crazy. And uh, it's just terrible. So 90 days, prayerfully, when it's up, I'll probably just get banned again, but we're just going to keep doing it. You know, the, the studio interviews, which we have one coming up soon, those will be in YouTube only. We will not be streaming the new studio videos to Facebook anymore, YouTube only, but the rest of the content will still be dumped on Facebook, but it'll just be, it is what it is. It feels bad, but I, I, what, what can I do? Sharon Becerra, thank you so much. So welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your time away. Thank you, Sharon. I did. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm just not feeling good today because I have this ear infection. And so, yeah, if I'm a little bit like low energy or you're like, why are you seem tired or sad? I'm not tired. Well, I am kind of tired because I was up most of the night because my ear was hurting so bad. But I am I'm not sad. I'm, I'm blessed. I just la yesterday got an ear infection. I haven't had an ear infection since I was nine years old. What in the world? How does that even happen? Thank you, Anonymous. You're a great brother, Isaiah. Praying for your ear in Jesus' name. Thank you, Anonymous. Appreciate you. Tomorrow night, we have the podcast with Freddie uh oh my gosh lorenzo jr did i just say his name wrong hold on richard i just said freddy i'm reading someone's name freddy <laughs> richard not freddy lorenzo i just literally read the name freddy and said freddy lorenzo richard lorenzo jr I've, I've reacted to several of his videos um he'll be on tomorrow night okay richard not freddy see guys my mind i can't think right the devil is a liar oh no no i know what happened it wasn't a comment. I was reading a donation from Freddie and Priscilla. That's a knee slapper. I was reading a donation from Freddie and Priscilla. As I said, tomorrow night we have on. I was reading their comment. Okay, Freddie and Priscilla, thank you. Say, glad to have you back. Great finale for the book of John. And then I have your prayer request. Thank you so much, Freddie and Priscilla. You guys are legends. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Tomorrow night. It's going to be good. Okay. What is happening right now? Oh, uh, thank you, Freddie and Priscilla. Warren and Donna. Thank you. So it's so great. Just love the verse by verse. Thanks for teaching in this way. Thank you, Warren and Donna. I don't know the next book. The next book we do verse by verse will not be Matthew, Mark, or Luke. It'll be the shorter books because we just finished a whole thing. And yeah, ear infections, listen, are terrible. Like a month ago, I was thinking about when I was younger, I used to get them kind of often. And I was like, man, those are so terrible. Like they're the worst. And then ironic, I have one now. And it's, I was like terrible last night, y'all. I was... Oh, I was so, in so much pain. I was like handling myself, praying the fire of God over my ear and all that. So yes, tomorrow, tomorrow is not Freddie Lorenzo Jr. It's Richard. Richard Lorenzo Jr. will be on tomorrow. He's blown up on YouTube. He has some great content. I've reacted to some of his videos, but yes, he'll be on tomorrow. It's going to be a great day. But yeah, ear infections are terrible. If you get them often, I'm, I'm so sorry for you. I will pray for you. All right, let's read the Venmo. Again, guys, we need your guys' help and support if you're able to. Thank you. Let's read the Venmo. We are off for 12 days, and of course, streaming is our income. Without uh, live streaming, we wouldn't be able to do this full-time. Put it that way. Okay. Let's go to the Venmo. Uh, Galila, thank you so much. Shannon Lefebvre, Lef Lef thank you. Ellison Parker, thank you. Sarah Campbell, thank you for the generous donation on Venmo. Angela Garcia, thank you. Melissa Eggleston, thank you. Gabby Hildago, thank you. And Jonna, oh, Johanna Hill, thank you so much. Anonymous, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's terrible. Joy Rogers, thank you so much for the Venmo. Those are all in Venmo. I'll read the messages after because Venmo doesn't let me read the messages because it refreshes and all that. Okay, questions, questions. Let's chat. Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. I miss you guys. What's new? Let's talk. Let's talk. Will tomorrow be in person streaming the studio? No. Tomorrow will be a original Zoom podcast. It will not be in studio. He lives in Florida and uh, it was kind of just, yeah, it won't be in studio. Yeah, I did eardrops and all that and yeah. Ugh, feels, feels terrible. Do you like roller coasters? No, I don't. I hate roller coasters. I get motion sick. And so I don't like roller coasters. Avoid elevation changes with ear infections. They take time to heal. Okay, good Good to know. Thank you. How can I get you to our church in Glendale, California for revival? Right now, I'm not really taking bookings. I'm only doing events with people I know. I've literally gotten hundred booking, hundreds of bookings this year and I've only taken like three. So yeah, right now I'm not traveling a lot because I'm trying to spend time on the content and 
my church, my home church. I really want to spend time there and I have a lot of other things I need to do. So it's hard to travel right now. The laughing man, Nico. Uh, Nico will be, will be on soon. We're going to get a laugh cam for him soon. How'd you spend your time last week? Just hanging out with my family. Just hanging out with the family. Literally just home with my wife and kids and just spending time with them and being off of social media. Honestly, guys, I'm rarely even on social media. Like, I don't go on Facebook and look at people's pages. I don't look at people's pages on Instagram. I'll randomly comment here and there, rarely, but I don't really go on social media much. But I, I'm just checking and like responding to my stuff a lot and looking at my YouTube a lot and just spending too much time on my phone and I hate it. So I'm working my best to cut back on. I want to, I only want to be spending time if I'm not with my family or in prayer of the word, I want to be getting educational content in educational podcasts, real good godly stuff pouring into me. I don't want to be just wasting my time scrolling through TikTok or scrolling through what my cousin ate on Facebook. Like it's just, it's a waste of time. It's just toxic too. And so, and, and I'm trying, uh, it's like weird because I, I don't read comments really on most of the pages. The only time I'll read comments is usually my, my YouTube because it's not toxic. TikTok, I don't read any comments. Uh, short videos, I don't really read comments because they're very, the comments are usually very toxic and that it's a whole thing. So YouTube is like, this is where I engage with comments. So if you want to talk to me and get something across, if you want to say I'm awesome or call me a false prophet, this is the best place to do it right here on the, on the comments because I'm reading all of these. Because I don't like spending time on on social media. It's just so toxic. And it just feels terrible to be on the phone all day long. Are we still doing the Chosen reaction? Well, the Chosen's over. We finished the Chosen. When the new season comes out, yes, we will. Yes, yes, yes. Do adults get ear infections commonly? I haven't had one since I was a little kid. I know kids do, but do adults? Do adults get those? Garlic oil from the health food store. I do not know how this confetti's flying around my office. I just got scared right now because a piece of confetti just flew right in front of me. I was like, what is that? Is that a demon in my office? How is it getting in the air? It's literally on the floor. Somehow it's getting into the air and then flying around. The devil is a liar. Okay. Um, one time I real blew up on Facebook and the comments are terrible. Yeah, because the thing about short videos is they get put to people that are like whoever, non-Christians, whatever. So you get a bunch of crazy comments. Yes, go to the YouTube if you're on Facebook. There is coming a day likely where I will be completely deleted. I do, yes, I have a fan on, but my fan is lifted up on a chair. Like it's not, and my fan's literally this far off the ground. It's way off the ground and all the confetti is on the ground. Yet somehow it's getting shot up into the air and floating around. Someone said, screw Satan. Uh, I probably wouldn't have said it that way, but yes, amen. Do we address God or Jesus when we pray? Either one. Breaking news of fossil prophet returns. Yeah, I'm a fossil prophet. Yes. Is transgenderism a demon? Uh, I just told you I'm banned on Facebook and you're, you're trying to set me up. But yeah, a lot of times I think it is. I think most of the time it is. Yeah. Anonymous. I love the verse by verse. Thanks so much. Thank you, Gerilyn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, thank you for the financial support, the monthly giving, the donations, all that keeps us going. We really appreciate it. We, we live by faith. We're not on a salary anywhere. So we're living by faith and we appreciate you guys supporting us. Deliver popular YouTubers live? Uh, that's probably not, probably not. A lot of people don't want to be blasted like that. My air conditioning's up way and it's not even powerful at all. I don't have like my window one on. I, I, I bought a humidifier or I, I found one that I had a long time ago. I've had my humidifier blasting because I online they said, if you run your AC, it takes the humidity out of the air. Your throat will start hurting because lately, like when I've been doing my teachings, my throat's been super scratchy and dry all the time when I'm doing these and it hurts the whole time. So I was like, I'm going to get a humidifier, all that. But then it still happened tonight. So I don't know why I'm trying to figure out why my throat is super dry and scratchy every time I preach. And this is all just happening. It's just so weird. I stopped taking my allergy medicine because of the, oh, maybe my allergy medicine. Maybe it's my, maybe it is my allergies because, you know, seasonal allergies. I don't know. Who knows? Did you hear about the Euphrates River drying up and an angel scooping up the four angels? Here's the thing. You don't have to worry about all that Bible prophecy because we're going to know when it happens. It's going to happen regardless. Did you get your mouth surgery? Not yet. No, I still have to do three to four months of, you know, tongue therapy stuff before she'll, she'll do it. 
What interest do you have? Uh, what internet do you use to stream? I use, uh, I think it's, uh, what's the name of it? I forget, Spectrum. Tomorrow, 6 p.m. Pacific, yes. What do you think about the singing monster games for kids? I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. Yeah, I think it's my allergies. It has to be because it's only this time of year. So, but this is the only time I use AC. Excuse me. So I thought maybe it was my AC. I don't know. Who knows? Will you go through the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel? Eventually, yes. Have you been keeping up with your tongue exercises? Imagine new people like, what is he talking about? Uh, yes and no. Lucas, thank you. What brand of glasses are you wearing? These are Steve Madden. Costco special, you know what I mean? Is Coco Melon demonic? I don't think so. Biggest pet peeve? Um, I, you have to give me context. Because I could say I have a lot of pet peeves, but context is hard. Yeah, context. Clean your filter? I did. I put a brand new filter in. Yeah, yeah, I put a brand new AC filter in. What happened to your dad's finger? Did everything turn out okay? Yes. My dad's finger is doing better. It did not get amputated. It was a complete miracle. Can you make the pigeon appear? I got you. Even though some people are scared of the pigeon. I don't know why. Where is he at? There he is. There you go. Was it funny when I did this real life confetti? It really hurt my ear. So I'm glad it was. I cannot believe how loud it was. What in the world? Is cussing a sin? Yes. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. You'll be judged by every, on every idle word. I don't listen any pastor that justifies cussing do not listen to that pastor that's all I could say any pastor that justifies or cusses I don't know how you could how could you ever take a guy serious that cusses I don't understand and I used to cuss every other word before I was saved but how could salt water and fresh water come out of the same river you know what I'm saying no cussing's a major L and it's 10 thumbs down the confetti was it funny I'm glad Thank you, Adriana. And thank you, everyone that's been here. Every time I come back from being gone, I'm just like, oh, there's only going to be five people. So I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, yeah, pastors that defend cussing is that's such a weird take. I don't even understand that. You, it, it directly violates scripture. Like, and then they try to say, well, that wasn't a cuss word in the Bible. It's like, dude, what? It's cultural context. A cuss word here might not be a cuss word in France. Obviously, then it wouldn't be considered a cuss word. Like, oh man, it just makes me go crazy. Post a confetti clip, I might. Has it been hitting the tongue gym? Yep, I have been. I've been doing the tongue exercises. What's important is praying on your knees? Well, it's biblical, but also it's a way of submitting, humbling yourself. There's something about humility when you're on your knees, that posture of you submitting yourself to God. Look at this bird shake my head. Are you afraid of the dove? Don't be afraid of the dove. The dove likes you. Don't be mad at it. Who named Carl Carl? I don't even know. I don't even know. My, I, I don't know. What's the most uh, annoying content you consistently get? What's the most annoying content you consistently get? What do you mean by that? The most annoying content is the heresy hunters. They're annoying. Everything's wrong but them. I can't stand people like that. But... Basically, the heresy hunters are the guys that at the end of class ask for homework. Ask the, they ask the teacher for homework before class is out. But yeah, that's how I feel about that. That's, to me, the most annoying content on the internet. Why do they call you a false prophet? Well, from what I've seen, it's always because I believe in deliverance and miracles. I believe in deliverance. I believe in deliverance for Christians specifically. And so that's every video I've been called a false prophet that I've seen is because I believe deliverance is for believers as well. So they hate that. Is my hairline natural? Yes. Yes, I have that Star Trek hairline. All natural Star Trek edition. Although I've never seen Star Trek in my life, I've heard that I have the Star Trek hairline, so you know. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, what do you... I'm trying to read all the comments, guys. Let's talk. Let's see. Thanks, bro. I've been watching your content for a while. I really appreciate your being slower. Iron Sharp Iron. Thanks, Swains. Appreciate you. Are you doing deliverance tonight? No, we're actually at the end of the stream. We're almost two hours in. Actually, I'll hang out with you guys till the two hour mark for old times. You know what I'm saying? It's been 12 days. And then we'll be live again tomorrow at six. Do you enjoy camping? Yes. 
Camping is one of our favorite pastimes. Actually, probably our favorite pastime as a family. We'll be doing a lot of camping this year and we love to go camping. We love the outdoors. We love all that good stuff. That'd be cool. Bo Diddle came on. We've talked a few times. I've never seen Star Trek either. I've just heard that. Yeah, I love the outdoors. Love being outside. Tomorrow's 6 p.m., not a.m. Um, I will be at Pastor Locks in September, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. I think. Where do you go camping? Oh, I can't tell you. In California. I can't tell you because then you're cool. But then when I go camping, which I'm going to be going camping in a few weeks for like a while. And people are just weird. They'll show up and be weird. We really do. Every time we go camping, we see people from the stream and we love talking and all that. But it's it's organic. It's like, hey, how are you? What are you doing here? But it's not weird. Like, hey, I'm stalking you. So I don't want to tell you guys where I go camping and then you show up and be weird and like stalk me. It just feels bad. There's a lot of people that can watch this, right? Like this is for the whole internet to see. So I don't want to blow up the spot. You know what I'm saying? I got kids. If I didn't have kids, listen, if I didn't have kids and a wife and I was just a single guy, I wouldn't care if you guys knew where I camp, where I live, none of that. But I want I got to protect my family, my kids. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's no, it's no, it's a no. That's why I don't tell people where I live, my address, all of that. I already had too many weird things, too many weird people. So I can't, I can't. L stalkers. But if I see you camping out here in California somewhere, let's talk and hang out and pray and all that. It'll be good. I'd love to meet you. But yeah, I'm not going to tell you where. I thought it was Boba. <laughs> That's hilarious. What is a heresy hunter? It's just someone that has a YouTube channel where they call everyone a false prophet. Yeah. That's a heresy hunter. They they just try to hunt everyone that they think is a heretic. They're just they're cringe. They're just cringe. That's it. Will you ever do deliverance in Phoenix, Arizona? Yes. I'll be back in Phoenix probably this year sometime. Tell us one of the stories. What stories? Yeah, listen. I guarantee all of you guys in the chat, probably 99.9% .9 of you are amazing, cool. If I told you where I go camping, it would be good. But there's just a couple people that, not everyone here likes me. Let's just, let's just put it this way. Not everybody in the chat is here because they like me. And I know because they make videos about me. I'm like, the only way you knew all this is because you watched my whole video and you were in my live. So yeah, I'm not trying to leak stuff. I'm 31. I will be 32 May 29th. Should I have a birthday stream? May 29th is Monday night. Memorial Day. It's my birthday and Memorial Day. And I'm actually going camping that week. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. It's my birthday and it's Memorial Day and I'm going camping the next day. So we'll find out. Birthday stream, maybe, maybe not. Do you believe in pre-trib or post-trib? Post-trib. A show post trib. I mean, I just believe what the Bible says. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying out here? I just believe the Bible, so I'm post trib because it's just in there. It's in there. Don't hate. You know what they say? Don't hate the player, hate the game. Let's celebrate your birthday together. You can do a Sunday. Oh, that's true. I'll think about it. I'll pray about it. I'll think about it. I'll be 32 at the end of May. May 29th is my birthday. I got saved in 2011. <laughs> Don't even start asking how many years ago all that. We already did that before. I got saved in 2011. You can do the math. Why don't you think you're an apostle? I mean, I just don't go by titles. Is there a topic you get tired of preaching on? Not really. Revelation 3.10 says pre-trib. It definitely doesn't, Joseph. Don't make me go off, brother. It definitely doesn't. I used to preach pre-trib, so I already know all the arguments. I literally preached pre-trib, and then I realized, oh, actually, I can't even find any verses to defend my position. And then I was like, oh, maybe because it's not biblical. And then I was like, oh, yeah, it's not. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm.
Yeah, the Church of Philadelphia wasn't in the tribulation. So uh, there, that church is gone and the tribulation hasn't happened. So it wasn't talking about the tribulation. You guys should watch my video with Dr. Brown about it. Pastors will preach politics, but not deliverance. Amen. You're general in the faith. Thank you, Laura. Favorite topic to preach on? I mean, my favorite topic to preach on is... I don't know. Probably deliverance. Honestly, I enjoy preaching on it. I just enjoy preaching on it because it's so few people do. So there's a lot of like, oh, wow, I can't believe the Bible says that. I don't even know. But I don't know. I, I like... I just love preaching on anything. Where is in Jesus' name? Oh, the movie will be out streaming everywhere in June. Next month, the movie will be on all streaming platforms. What is my favorite song? I don't know that I have a favorite. Amazing teaching. Thank you. Talk about your first deliverance. Um, Not right now. Come out in Jesus' name. Is that what you're talking about? The come out in Jesus' name movie that we're a part of comes out in all streaming platforms next month in June. Can you fake a real Southern draw? No, I can't. I'll just embarrass myself. Do you still drum? I can. I just don't often. What do you think about birth control? Uh, I have mixed feelings on it, but I don't think it's inherently bad because it prevents. It doesn't end. There's a difference between birth control and like a plan B or, or an abortion pill because uh, birth control prevents it from ever happening. So no life is created. Did you see Nefarious? Yes. Chelsea, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked because I'm going to be doing a video review this weekend on nefarious i need to collect my thoughts i i'm mixed on nefarious i i did get a pre-screening from uh the team that made the movie and stuff and i didn't watch it i went to the theater i didn't watch the email pre-screen because i wanted to watch it in theaters so me and my wife went and watched it in theaters and i have mixed feelings on it okay i really liked it and i want to recommend it to everybody but i can't and i'll tell you why in the video you got to come see the video I'll tell you now and then you can watch the video this weekend because most of you, there's only a thousand of you here. So it's not like, you know, it is what it is. Um, it was good. It was definitely biblical. I think the theology was sound, but I think it stopped short of a gospel presentation. And here's why. Okay, let me just give you a couple thoughts and I might wrestle because I, I actually thought it was really good. The acting, it, it was all theologically sound. But just hear me, please, and don't get mad at me, but hear my reasoning. Okay. You're an unbeliever in the theater. You already know it's a Christian movie. You're not going to finish it and think, oh, I don't know if that was Christian. So you already know it's Christian, so you might as well just go all the way. But if you're an unbeliever in the movie theater and you watch that movie and you start manifesting a demon, which you probably will because it's all about a demon talking. So you're an unbeliever. You're sitting in the theater. You start manifesting, getting anxious and nervous. There's no hope. There's no hope for you. You just manifest. There's no deliverance. There's no check out a deliverance map. There's no, if you need help, scan a QR code at the end. There's no hope at all. So I think that's very dangerous. Do somebody help me. Do, am I wrong? If you went and saw Nefarious, did you feel that way? Did you feel hopeless? Did you feel like, well, there's no hope. There's no, there's no freedom. And I don't want to give the movie away, but even at the end of the movie, even at the end of the movie, it's basically like, you're never going to be free. Okay, so that's number one. Why I... W okay, let me collect my thoughts. I would recommend it to solid, seasoned Christians that already know about deliverance, that are already saved, delivered, all that. I would not recommend it to unbelievers, and I would not recommend it to new Christians. That's where I'm at with it. And I'll make a video on all the reasons why this weekend and give a candid talk about it. But... um that's why I probably wouldn't have the people on the podcast and I was going to before, but I had to watch it first. But now that I think about it, it's like, uh, I don't think I'd promote it to my audience. And I'll talk about that in my video review. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, what if you decide during the movie you want to be delivered? What are you going to do? Where are you going to go to get delivered? If you decide as an unbeliever, I want to get free from demons, which is probably not the conclusion you get watching that movie. Where are you going to go? They didn't point you anywhere. They didn't say... You know, check out our resources. There's nothing. It's just, I agree with you. Okay, glad I'm not the only one. I talked to a bunch of pastors and friends and they all felt very similar. Okay. Also, this is the other thing I didn't like about the movie. Okay, stay with me because this might get a little, it might be kind of hard to wrap your head around, but it's, sim it's a simple concept. We are trying to show people that deliverance is not this crazy thing just for serial killers. 
We're trying to show people deliverance was normal people. In the Bible, these were normal average people that had demons. And oftentimes, when we cast out demons, it's on normal average school teachers, business owners, police officers, nurses, doctors, Starbucks workers, name it, fill in the blank. Okay, it's normal people getting deliverance. Can we agree on that? These are not always some... The movie made it seem like deliverance is just for serial killers and it's super crazy and like... So what happens is people see that and go, oh, yeah, those type of people have demons, but a normal person like me doesn't have demons. So I don't like that because we're trying to demystify deliverance. We're trying to make it normal like it was in the Bible, not make it like only scary serial killers have demons. If I wasn't, if I didn't do deliverance and, and, and see it all in scripture, then I'd be like, oh, the movie was really good. I can recommend it to everybody. But because I know the ins and outs of deliverance, I, I just think it's dangerous when you have a movie where people, you know, potentially they'll manifest a demon, but there's no hope. Literally. There's literally no hope. If you saw the movie, am I wrong? Come on, help me. But did it do what it tried to do? I think so. Now, the pushback would be, well, they didn't want people to know, you know, it was a Christian movie like that. It wasn't meant to preach. Really? The whole movie literally preached. It was all about Jesus and like all that. So it for sure did. It just stopped at the 10 yard line and lost the game, in my opinion. It stopped at the 10 yard line. So if you're a solid Christian, go see it. Yes. If you're a solid Christian, it exposes, it's, it's powerful, it's good acting, all that. If you're solid, if you're a new believer, if you're an unbeliever, I don't think you should watch it. So yeah. So now if someone goes and sees it, because they're trying to reach, you know, they, they, would, they would respond to me with like, well, brother, and I know I'll get pushed back and stuff because I know the people, you know, they follow me that have made it and they've reached out and all that. I know it's all, I have to be careful what I say online because it's going out into the airwaves on in internet land. But, um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, just in the theater, there was people there that I could tell weren't believers and they were just like, like one of the kids at the end, I heard him talking with a group of friends, which I should have went up and talked to them. I regret not talking to them, but he was just like, oh, I feel weird now. And he's like, yeah, I feel like this dark like he just like i just feel weird like i don't feel right after watching it right and so he was probably manifesting like let's be honest if you have a demon you're gonna probably manifest nefarious you're gonna probably manifest watching it oh oh i know what i was saying so their pushback to me would probably be well we weren't trying to be like an overly christian music where we christian movie where we well where we preach but at the same time it's like you were you already are a christian movie you're already labeled you you know you're you they promote it as creators of God's not dead three creators like it's already a Christian movie so just go all the way at the end go all the way and if you saw the movie you know what I'm talking about but those are my gripes am I wrong or right if you saw the movie tell me what you think yeah I'm talking about nefarious I'll, I'll put a video out this weekend about it and whether I recommend or not and I think you already know my answer but um the best way I can describe it is what do you think about Jesus revolution 12 out of 10 chef's kiss jesus revolution was amazing absolutely incredible I loved every second of it um so yeah they already labeled as christian you should just go all in that's what i think okay um now but it is a christian movie okay so now what was i gonna say uh what was i gonna say i lost my train of thought what do you guys think what do you guys think am i right wrong weak strong let me know um if you saw the movie let me know not if you saw the preview, if you saw the movie. Again, if you're solid, 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 I could recommend it, but I can't recommend it for new Christians or unbelievers. I didn't see the Pope's Exorcist. I heard it was demonic and it's not a Christian movie. So I just left. I just left with, after watching The Forest, the only way I could describe it was I left feeling empty. I left feeling sad. I left feeling hopeless and frustrated. I, so I would say, oh, this is what I would give. I think Bob Larson said something similar, but the best way I could thing I could say about Nefarious is one thumbs up, two thumbs down. That's what I would give it. A one thumbs up, two thumbs down. So yeah. It's a Christian movie though. The the Nefarious is for sure, for sure. Jesus Revolution is amazing. And I actually had Greg Laurie on. If you guys didn't see that episode talking about it, he's the one the movie's about. But man, you you need to see Jesus Revolution yesterday. Lorianne, you need, you need to watch Jesus Revolution yesterday, okay? That means you should have watched it. You got to watch it. It's so good. Now, do we have anyone 
in the chat that went and saw Nefarious that could agree with your boy here or has a pushback on it? Is anybody? Um. Oh, thank you, Bill Hughes. Thank you for saying my theology is weak, but not giving one reason why. I appreciate that, brother. You would be on Facebook, Bill. Not to be mean, Bill, but you would be a fa Facebook user, if you know what I mean. Sorry. Sorry, that was rude. That was uncalled for. I'm sorry, Bill. I shouldn't have said that, okay? I apologize, Bill. I was in the flesh when I said that. Sorry. But yeah, I would like if you're going to come in my chat and say your theology is weak, I would love to know why. Considering that I'm literally teaching verse by verse the Bible, um, I have orthodox positions, I have a degree, four years in theology, and all that other good stuff. I would love to know why rather than just your theology is weak. The movie seemed creepy like it would invite demons. Uh, I don't know. It, it could, if it, it, you know, it could maybe a spirit of fear. I saw it. Two thumbs up, one thumbs down. Okay, that's fair, JC. That's fair. Two thumbs up, one thumbs down. Maybe I'm being harsh on it. But I just feel like, uh Someone said weak moment. Yeah, I just, when people come in my chat and they go, oh, you're very good anointing, but your theology is weak. It's like, tell me why. How are you just going to come up and drive by and say, your theology is weak and keep driving? I'm like, what? Dude, I'm out here. Tell me why. I mean, if you're going to be a keyboard warrior, you might as well go all the way. And the crazy part is about internet land is I have met thousands of people in all my events, all my time going out. When we go places, people come up. I watch your YouTube. I've literally met thousands of people just on the street that have watched my videos. Not one person has ever said one negative thing to me into my face ever, not once. But on internet land, they'll make videos, they'll hundreds of comments. It's like, dude, anyone can be a keyboard warrior. Anyone can be a couch theologian. I just, the whole culture of like not saying it to your face. I won't say anything online that I won't say to your face. That's just cringe to me. We're all adults, which is weird. Anyways, that's that. Uh, yeah, if you, it's not a horror movie at all. It's a psychological thriller. To me, I wouldn't call it a scary movie. It wasn't scary to me, but maybe, maybe it could. Okay, what did someone say? I want to know people that went and saw it. Give me your synopsis. If you left the movie feeling empty, it's not fully of God because God fills you. Yeah, I agree. What's orthodoxy? It's like, it's like, it's like, uh, uh, what's always been the standard, like the Trinity as an Orthodox Christian position. Um, salvation by faith alone is like an Orthodox position. The word of God being like our authority is Orthodox. When you start saying like the word of God is not my authority, but I'm a Christian, that's unorthodox. It's not, I'm trying to explain it in simple terms, but you get it. It's like the standards. It's, it's you know what I'm saying? Maybe the guys weren't ready to tackle deliverance. For sure, Shane. For sure. I know the guys that made it. I, I get it, right? Like, I know I have friends that are friends and stuff like that. So I totally get it, but I just feel like, I don't know. I don't know. I could be wrong. It's the norm. Yeah, there you go. How do you feel about denominations? I'm non-denominational. I don't, I don't ascribe to them. So nobody saw it. Okay, so a lot of people didn't even see it, which is interesting. Uh, if they don't lead people to some kind of deliverance, the things they can open up people even worse. Yeah, I mean, imagine you go and you get a spirit of fear. I'm just saying. I'm not saying you you it, hap it happen, but I just, as an unbeliever, if it's like, well, we're trying to reach unbelievers, okay. So if you have a movie about demons to unbelievers, but there's no deliverance, I mean, what are we doing here? You know what I mean? I, I'm not trying to be harsh. I thought the acting was good. I thought the message was good. It was supposed to be like the screw tape letters, but it just stopped at the ten yard line. So, I'm not going to go on Rumble because Rumble has a super tiny audience and there will be like 30 views. It's just not worth the time. Yeah, so. Where is your church in Stockton, California? Life song. Uh, okay, someone said, I saw it and felt empty because of no deliverance. Okay, exactly. Again, if you're a solid Christian, I would say watch it. But if you're not, if you're a new believer or an unbeliever, do not, do not watch it. You and Pagani seem under attack. I don't feel under attack. 
I I stay in my own lane, y'all. Literally. All the stuff happening on internet land, I don't even pay attention to. My mom said I thought maybe- Oh, mom, you saw it! I forgot to ask you about it. Mom, did you feel similar to how I felt? I forgot to talk to you about it. Again, I thought it was super good. My wife said movie was super good, but missed a huge opportunity for the gospel, hope, deliverance, and freedom at the end. Yes. The next day, I was like, oh, I really liked it, and it had a good message, and it was interesting, but again, can't recommend it to my audience. Yeah, so, like, when you're like, oh, I feel like Isaiah, you're getting attacked, I don't even see the attacks or the videos because I stay off of internet land for my mental sanity. So, it's just Jesus, my ministry, my family, my church. I don't, I'm, I'm in that world. I don't, I'm not watching what everyone's saying this. People make videos like, I don't even know. Doesn't even affect me because I didn't read your comment. So I don't even care or know. You think Jesus was like reading comments? Look what the Pharisee said about me, Peter. Look what the Pharisee said about me, John. No, he was on, he was at the praying all night. Backside of the mountain. He was off praying. I mean, it's like, where in the Bible does it say we're supposed to be liked? In fact, the Bible says we're not going to be liked by religious people and by the world. So, uh, Paul's like, if I was trying to be liked, I wouldn't be a Christian. My mom said, I didn't think of the things you did, but it was a story with no conclusion. Okay, yeah, agree. So that's that. You guys asked about Nefarious. Those are my take on it. I'll make a whole video on it. I so badly want to be like, yes. And I was like, oh, but yeah. I hope I don't ruffle up too many people when I make the video. And I hope it's not like, you know, negative. But I have to because people keep asking and I have a platform. And you know what I mean? I think a sequel would be cool, mom. I don't think it will happen, but I think a sequel would be good. I think they had a chance. If you've seen the movie, you know what I mean? At the end, they have a chance right there at that one part. You all know what I'm saying? To be like, this is it. I mean, they had, it was perfect spot. And it just, it just fell flat. Give us some more spoilers. I don't, I mean, I don't want to spoil it if you're going to watch it. Um... Is Kelsey Grammer saved now? I know he had a crazy history, but how do you feel about people in the world playing Christian roles you think they can do right? I don't know if he's saved, but it definitely had an impact on him. Maybe he is. But yeah, I think I think worldly people can play Christian roles in movies because obviously it's not real. My mom said a lot of the storyline can only be followed by a committed believer. Yeah, for sure. Maybe it would have, uh, maybe it would have if it came out before G come out in Jesus' name, but now we can't sell for anything less. I feel it. Yeah, also it came out right at the same time as come out in Jesus' name, so I'm like contrasting the movies. They're not comparable because ours is a documentary, but still, it's just like, I, I personally watching it and, and in the theater, the atmosphere and the people around, I was gauging it by that. Excuse me. My mom is Janelle, um, what's her, Janelle Surgic on YouTube. That's my mom. And my little sister is Cherish... Is it Chanel? I don't even I don't even see her username right now, but I think it's Cher Chanel. That's my little sister. Uh, thank you, random person, for that comment. We're gonna be doing more prayer. We should probably do prayer on Friday, honestly. Yeah, two different movies, completely. One's a psychological thriller, one's a documentary. You can't even compare them. Cherish Downey. I'm sorry, that was Chanel. She, it's Downey. Cherish Downey is my sister on YouTube. Nate Hills is my brother-in-law. We got all the family represented here. Alyssa Saldivar obviously is my wife. Make your mom a mod. I can't make my mom a mod because she doesn't know how to do it and she might end up accidentally muting and banning people. So I don't think she wants to be a mod. Um, I don't think she wants to be. I mean, I could show her in person how to do it, but you know, my mom might accidentally mute you, Evangelist Jana. You know what I'm saying? Who knows? We don't know. We don't know out here. Technology is like you start pressing buttons. Who knows what happens? I had a great vacation. Thank you. Come out in Jesus name is not in theaters or it might be in select theaters, but it's going to be in streaming. My sister's laughing. Yeah, my, I don't think my mom wants to be a mod because you know what I mean? She, she might accidentally press something and, and mute my wife. Who knows? I don't know. Plus, not only that, my mom would be banning half of y'all up in here. My mom said I don't want to be a mod. Yeah, my mom would be like, don't be talking about my son like that. She would have banned Bill t back into 1985. I mean, she would have been, you know what I'm saying? The mom's defensive. The moms are protective, so. 
if my daughter made me a mod in her chat, all y'all would be getting banned. I'd be like, what'd you say about my daughter? Banned. What'd you say about my daughter? Banned. What'd you say about her hairline? Banned. Everybody would be getting banned. I'll be. Ha it would literally just be me and my mom in the chat. It'd be me and my daughter in the chat because I'd ban everybody. It would just be me and her. Yeah, you don't need to see their comments, honey. They're mean. Don't worry. It'd all be getting banned. Bill would have crawled right back into his cave. Too far. All right. I love you guys. It was fun hanging out with you guys. For sure, we'll be live tomorrow. Hanging out. <laughs> Making some more. I hope some of you get my humor, okay? My humor is drier than my throat right now. My humor is about as dry as the American church currently. So, my, you know, I say things that are just dry humor. That's what it is. I love you guys. I'll be live tomorrow night. We're back in the rhythm. There's... Did you guys see that confetti? <laughs> what a way to end the stream. A piece of confetti just flew right behind me. The devil is a liar. This confetti still is flying around my room somehow. It's bizarre. But anyways, I thought it was funny. Because a piece of confetti just flew behind me. Anyways. Where was I? My humor's dry. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, it's all good. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. We'll be live tomorrow. It's going to be amazing. And then, God willing... We'll be live on Friday, but we'll be back in the swing of things, recording videos, posting content, new videos this weekend, all that good stuff. I need to do more. I need to do more. Love you guys. Appreciate you guys. My wife said, time the confetti. Did I miss it? Oh, you missed it about an hour ago, Alyssa. The confetti was literally over an hour ago, but I'll get you some virtual confetti so you don't feel bad. There you go. There's some virtual confetti for you. All right, we're done. Book of John finale. Thanks for being here. Love you guys. Thanks for donating, monthly partnering, all that good stuff. Oh, you wanted the dove and the, and the confetti? I gotcha. All right. What a good night. Love you guys. Hang out for the song. It is Come Out in Jesus' Name by Jeffrey Jocelyn. It's straight fire. Good night. Love y'all. Thank you for being here. I love you guys. Have a good night. Come for the stream, stay for the song. The Holy Ghost, the Bible, and the Mods, type the song, the please, word. in the chat. This world is in denial, but let the truth yeah, the song is straight fire. 10 out of 10. Every Christian. I still don't know why the Dove Awards. Come on, Dove Awards, where are you at? If you work for the Dove Awards, stop giving these awards out to all these lukewarm drinking worship teams. And come on, give my boy Jeffrey a, a Dove for this. Come on, you can do it. In one accord, we're moving forward, break every chain. Demons start to tremble, devils go insane. They feel the flames get hotter as they try to run away. Try to Jose Hernandez, what did you say? My wife said she loves you all. Best chat on YouTube. must come out in Jesus' name. How much do you love us? I love you a lot, Jose. Read it in the Bible. It's written there in red. You'll never be deceived if you believe what Jesus said. Some of you that hate the bird, you're gonna fall. You're gonna learn to love them. Tell everyone. You'll you'll learn to love them. I'm sorry. The, the kids love them. So what can I say? We gotta do it for the kids. <laughs> the dancing bird? I mean, how could you not laugh at that? I mean, how could you not laugh at that? You gotta do it for the kids, okay? It's for the kids. I got four little kids. Come on now. This is Jeffrey Jocelyn. Come out in Jesus' name. Someone said, no, I don't like it. Sorry. You don't like the dove, I'm sorry.
pigeon's name is Carl. Love y'all. Good to be back with you guys. Thank you for being here tonight. That was Come Out in Jesus' Name by Jeffrey Jocelyn. You can get it everywhere. Love you guys. Appreciate you guys. The movie will be out next month, streaming everywhere. Tomorrow night will be live at 6 o'clock, and then God willing, we'll be live Friday night with some type of prayer, or maybe Thursday. Who knows? Well, actually, probably Friday. Love you guys. Good night. Bye.